This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 91 was recorded on November 30th, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Variant Perception founder Jonathan Tepper will be joining me as this week's feature interview guest. Jonathan and I will discuss everything from the U.S. dollar to equity markets to Australian and Canadian real estate to the Chinese credit bubble. We also have a really special post-game segment planned for you this week, which you're not going to want to miss. So be sure to stay tuned after the feature interview, when Devin Anderson will be joining us for a deep dive into who's on the other side of the short vol trade we discussed last week, and what could go wrong and where the systemic risks lie. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 once again making all-time new highs this week. What's going on here in equities? Once again, Patrick, another week, another all-time high. I think probably the catalyst this morning was Senator John McCain agreeing to uh, a vote for President Trump's tax bill. And, of course, he was the, the linchpin that was potentially going to hold it up. That seems to have propelled, what was it, 26.58 on E-mini S&P futures at one point today. That happened Thursday around just before noontime. We're back down to 26.41, but still dramatically higher compared compared to next week. I'll be asking Jonathan for his views on this, but I'm going to stick to my story, which has been, you know, we're in the final stages of a bull market. There's probably more upside left. If you're going to participate in that upside, the way to do it is with options, because when this thing reverses, it's going to be ugly. I don't know when that's going to be, but I, I do have a feeling it's going to be ugly. What I would say on the bearish side of this is, you know, I've been saying for many weeks now, I, I don't see the end being in sight because what you would expect at the real end of a move like this is a final parabolic rise to a blow-off top, and we were seeing a steady grind higher. Well, it's starting to look today, at least earlier today, like maybe the beginnings of that parabolic rise. Now, it's reverted uh, this afternoon, but if we were to be talking, you know, by the end of the year, say, by the end of uh, December, and we're, you know, we're pushing 2,900 or 3,000, that would be telling me, okay, maybe the, the end is nigh. So far, I don't think we've seen it, though. All right. Well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar index next, because we obviously had a short term low, but it kind of popped. But now it's giving a little bit of back. It's uh, trading around this 92, 92 level here. What's your thinking on the dollar? Well, as you know, I had been leaning toward the resumption of the bull trend, but uh, I've become more and more persuaded that maybe Juliet de Klerk is right, that we really are seeing a reversal here. That failed head and shoulders pattern was definitely uh, something that got my attention. Juliet thinks that that's just an ABC move that was misidentified as a head and shoulders. We're going to get Juliet on the program within the next couple of weeks, and we'll get some more commentary for her. In the meantime, you know, the tell for me is below 91 or above 97. And I think below 91 is looking more likely to me at this point, but I'm going to wait. The jury's still out in my book. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil. You know, we had that big move to the $59 handle and uh, really at this stage, it's been giving a little bit back. Is, is there more upside here on oil or is this it? Well, Patrick, I do think that the top is probably in, at least for the short term. But let's start with inventory before we get to the big news of the week, which, of course, was the OPEC meeting today. Crude oil drawing down 3.4 million barrels nationally, 2.9 million barrels being drawn down from Cushing, Oklahoma. Now, that's a big drawdown for Cushing, Oklahoma. But keep in mind the spill on the Keystone Pipeline, which caused the deliveries from Canada to Cushing to be reduced by 85 percent, is a big causal factor there. I wouldn't be surprised to see an even bigger drawdown from Cushing next week, but I, I think this will be short-lived. They're going to get the pipeline back online, and then they're going to be pedaling as fast as they can in order to make up for lost ground. Meanwhile, gasoline building 3.6 million barrels, distillates building 2.7 million barrels. So the finished product builds actually outnumbered the crude oil draws. Production rose to 9.682 million barrels. 
And, uh, you know, again, I think the, the tape action in reaction to this, at first it was a little bit down, then it was a pretty good spike up, then it was down dramatically. But frankly, I think the down dramatically was news coming out about some questions about how committed Russia really was to the OPEC meeting today. So I think that the big downside that happened Wednesday afternoon, really at that point, people had forgotten inventory. They were looking ahead to the big event, which was today's OPEC meeting. The outcome is pretty much what was expected and already priced in, which is a nine-month extension through the end of calendar year 18 to the production cuts that had already been in place. And this is uh, not anything that was unexpected. It was already priced in. There are a few little anomalies just in my read of this. First thing that I noticed that nobody seems to be talking about yet is what they actually announced. I'm not sure it's what they meant, but what they announced is that the New Deal is effective January 1 through December 31. Everyone was expecting the existing deal that's good through the end of March for them to say the March end date is replaced by December 31st. They didn't say that, though. They said the new date is January 1 through December 31. So as I read that, it means there is no more production reduction or cut from now until January 1st. I don't think they meant it that way. I think they they meant to keep things in place, but that is actually what was announced today. Another thing that was interesting is what was verbally announced is what was verbally announced is that Libya and Nigeria are being brought into the deal. So they will be agreeing to production curbs as well, where they had previously been exempted from the prior agreement. Interestingly, though, the statement, the press release that was passed around at the meeting didn't make any mention of Libya or Nigeria. So perhaps that's something that got negotiated at the last minute in the meeting and didn't make it into the press statement. But they certainly were very clear about it in the the uh, press statement. Now, what people have not really picked up on yet is the language actually says that this will be subject to review and further adjustment at the June meeting. So this really is what everybody thought Russia was going to ask for, was, hey, let's just make this through June and we'll review it then and decide if we need to make it longer. I think that for public consumption, they realized it would play so much better instead of saying it's only a deal through June and maybe in June we'll extend it. They've done exactly the same thing. It's really no more committal than that, but they've worded it differently. They've said it is a deal through the end of the year and they might renege on that deal in June if they decide to based on their own sole discretion. So there's a weasel clause here that says they can change their mind in June. And at least as of this afternoon, we're only taping this a couple of hours after the OPEC press release. Nobody seems to really be focused on the fact that that is a weasel clause. At least that's the way I see it. I look at this as a sell the news event. You know, every potential long is already long. Everybody who was uh, speculating about this already got long crude oil futures. So let's step back now to the big picture. Again, my view has always been that we're going much, much higher in price after the supply glut clears. I just thought there was going to be one more wave down first before the glut cleared. Now, let's be frank. I've been pretty darn wrong this year in my calls on oil prices. And so it's entirely possible that it's all uphill from here. The consistent mistake that I've made, if I look at my own errors in the past, is underestimating the power of OPEC propaganda. You remember that Doha meeting where they were talking about how, oh, we're going to announce a production freeze. And I'm saying, guys, they're already producing as much as they possibly can. A freeze is meaningless. And a listener wrote back to us and said, Eric, it might be meaningless to you, but it had a huge effect on price. It almost doubled the price. It worked. So, uh, you know, maybe I just need to learn that when OPEC says the price should go higher, people just make the price go higher. I have to look at reality, though. It's just the way my brain is wired. Look at the massive amount of hedging that's happened in the last couple of weeks. I've heard that from my contacts in the industry telling me that investment bankers they talk to are doing a record number of hedging deals. We've seen it starting to show up in the commitment of traders reports. It shows up in the commercial swap dealers' short interest because the producing companies don't actually sell futures in the futures market. They make their deal with an investment bank. The investment bank eventually turns around and lays that risk off through swap dealers in the futures market. 
Rig count was up eight last week. Now, I won't be surprised. We don't have the number for this week yet. I won't be surprised if it's down because this week's number is for last week and it's a holiday week. You know, who's going to deploy new capital and new equipment and so forth on a holiday week? But I think that you're going to see a continued growth in the rig count. And I think, you know, they, they didn't do this hedging just for the heck of it. They did it to qualify for financing to drill more shale oil wells. So I think U.S. production is definitely going to be growing. That increase is coming. I think that the OECD inventory narrative is a little bit dubious. What they want you to believe is that all across the OECD, it's already happened. All the extra oil has already been drawn down. I don't think that's true. It's definitely being drawn down at a very rapid rate in the United States. That's because of the Brent WTI spread. Whether it's really being drawn down everywhere else, we know it's being accumulated in China, and I haven't seen any proof that it's been drawn down everywhere else. Else. They'd like you to believe that. I also think that the U.S. inventory, although it's definitely declining, it's declining for non-organic reasons. It's not because supply and demand have balanced. It's because we have this Brent WTI spread that's so wide that favors a lot of oil being sent to places other than the United States. So I do think this is going to be a sell-the-news event and that prices are going to head down from here. The big question in my mind, though, is you know it's, it's not that big of a deal to say, hey, all the longs were already long. It's, we're we're going to see at least some kind of correction here as it's a sell the news event. The question is how much of a correction? If we can get below $61 Brent and stay there, there's room to say, okay, maybe all uh, this, this big breakout we saw above that 38% retracement uh, of the really big move from 2014 to 2016, maybe that was a false breakout because even though it's been a couple of weeks now, you know, in the grand scheme of things, considering it was against a move that lasted a year and a half, th there's room to call that a false breakout, but only if we stay below 61. If we just go down and retest that level and move back above present levels from here, that tells me it's time for me to just throw in the towel and recognize that my next move lower maybe is not going to happen. But again, I go back to the hedging, the rig count, the U.S. production. All the dominoes are there to create one more wave down in prices before this is over. Curiously, this afternoon, we're not seeing any easing in prices yet, but the backwardation, which came into this market in anticipation of tightening supply, in anticipation of this OPEC uh, announcement, which we did get as expected today, that backwardation is coming out of the market. If I look at the time spreads, you can't look at the entire year of December 17 through December 18 because the December 17 contract already expired. But if I look at January 18 through December 18, that spread after hitting a high of 337 is down to 240 this afternoon. If I look at Z8, Z9, that's the spread across 2019. That's from 323 high down to 230 this afternoon. So backwardation is coming out maybe as a precursor of a move lower in front month prices. There's, again, a huge divergence in the view of some of the biggest traders. There are still some big players that think $45 Brent is going to be what it's about next year. There's an increasing number that think $70 Brent is more like it. We're at a very critical crossroads, and the thing I'm going to be watching is can we get below 61 Brent and stay there? If not, it's time for me to revisit my view. Well, thanks for that outlook, Eric, on oil. Now, I want to move on to gold here because uh, gold rejected 1300 and we've now seen that uh, selling coming down to about 1274 But what was interesting was that the day before gold reversed, the selling really started in the silver market. And I don't know fully how to read into that. But the question really is, is, is gold going to hold in here? Is that you know 1260, 1270 zone uh, really where the supports are going to hold? Or is there another leg coming down the downside? What's your thinking here? Well, Patrick, we're definitely seeing very strong round number resistance at 1300, as you said. Uh, and I'm very curious to see whether we're going to go below 1260 or above 1300 first. That's going to be the tell for me. Tracy Schuchart had a tweet out this week with a profile chart, market profile, showing repair areas down to the low 1200s. So I'm waiting for definitive directional confirmation on the U.S. dollar before I really have a fundamental view. In the meantime, I, I think the numbers to watch watch are 1260 on the downside, 1300 on the upside. And of course, two days ago, we were right there at 1300. It seemed like we were on the verge of a breakout. Now we're at 1270 or just above it. We touched 
1270 today, much closer to 1260 on that low side of the range. So it's, I think those are the numbers to watch and let's see what happens. Now, Eric, uh, you had an interesting perspective on uh, how Bitcoin could actually relate to gold. What were you thinking? Well, there's an age-old debate in the gold market, Patrick, and the gold bull argument, perhaps the you know gold bug argument, is, look, the futures market has just completely, totally distorted the price of gold. And the argument goes like this. Gold gets its value principally from its scarcity. That's what it's all about is scarcity. The futures market creates artificial supply. There's an unlimited number of futures contracts that can be created. And there's a lot of people in the market who, if there were no futures, would be buying physical gold. But because it's more efficient in terms of transaction costs to buy a paper futures contract, this paper gold market has been created. And the critics would argue that what that does is it dramatically increases the supply of gold because you've got the physical supply of gold plus the size of the open interest in futures. And if the whole value equation is based on the size of the supply, well, obviously that distorts it dramatically. Now, there's a counter argument to that. And the counter argument is that people would say, wait a minute, that's just not true because the gold market, the physical gold market, somebody is long all of that gold. For every futures long, there has to be a corresponding futures short. So for everybody who's long one contract of gold, somebody is short one contract of gold. The longs and the shorts balance out. The net long is unchanged. There's more open interest total, but you know you, you have shorts that balance out the longs in the futures market. Therefore, the futures market doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know who's right. This has been a philosophical debate that has raged on in the gold market for decades. Well, it occurs to me, We've got Bitcoin in a very, very strong uptrend, and now they're introducing Bitcoin futures by CME Group. If this argument that an asset that derives its value principally from scarcity is, you know, loses that scarcity value as soon as there's futures, we ought to see this rally in Bitcoin either stop or reverse as soon as the futures contracts go live. And that should change everything. If it doesn't change everything, well, that kind of maybe makes a point about who's right on this debate in the gold market. You know, Patrick, we have a lot of uh, graduate students in finance listening to Macro Voices. Somebody wants a thesis project. This is it, guys. What an opportunity to, you know, do an analysis of what happens in open interest and, you know, how many uh, Bitcoins there are in circulation What's the open interest in Bitcoin futures? How many does that create total? How much is it offset by short futures? And, you know, what does this do in terms of the price trend? I think it's a fascinating subject. I hope somebody picks it up. I'd love to read the paper someday. Patrick, while we're on the subject, I know you had a few thoughts about Bitcoin as well. Well, you know, using some technical analysis back in the middle of November with our members, we were identifying that 50% retracement Bitcoin had going down to the 5,600 handle. And when we measured it out, we were saying that this opened the window for potentially Bitcoin to have a measured move all the way up to 10,500 on the upside. What's really interesting here is that the last kind of three, four days, there was literally a parabolic blow off. It went from like literally 8,000 and all the way surpassing that 10,500 measured move uh, temporarily on an intraday basis, hitting that 11,500, but then immediately came in some very heavy selling. And after a move like that, it's interesting that, that this story on futures is coming out sort of at a time when there needed to be a sort of a catalyst for potentially some profit taking. It'll be very interesting if this is going to be a technical level where the, the short term and maybe even the intermediate highs of Bitcoin come in. It'll be interesting to see. The other thing, of course, is there was a headline today that the Fed has warned cryptocurrencies could pose serious financial stability issues. So as I have predicted all along, it's a matter of time before governments outlaw cryptocurrencies, at least in their current form. I believe that the future is going to be all about cryptocurrencies, but it's going to be state-backed cryptocurrencies where the seniorage in creating the currency goes to the government, not to uh, whoever's got the latest ICO or latest flavor of, of cryptocurrency to offer. And finally, Eric, I just wanted to talk about the 10-year yields. Uh, what's your thinking here about where interest rates are going? 
You know, I really don't have a whole lot to say this week. We're up to 240 from two spot 33 last week. Not a real big move. And that's what surprises me because I was thinking we were going to see a trend established. Once the Fed uh, chair nomination was made, I thought the market would be sensing out the direction. We'd see a clear trend emerge. Haven't seen it. I'd love to ask Juliet to clerk this question. We've got her coming up in a couple of weeks. That's all I've got for you. All right. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. Um, for this week's feature interview, Variant Perception founder Jonathan Tepper will be joining us. Eric's interview with Jonathan is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Variant Perception founder, Jonathan Tepper. Jonathan, we have a lot of super popular and super famous guests on this program. You have been definitely one of the most super popular with our listeners. Not probably as super famous as some. So for the benefit of our listeners who may be new to the show and have not heard your past interviews or the interview that we did with your associate, Tian Yang, give us a little bit of background first on Variant Perception because I, I love the name, by the way, but you guys are a very process oriented shop. And I think that it will help our listeners to understand the process that you approach investing and analysis with before we get into my favorite macro topics. So uh, give us some background. Uh, sure. So uh, thank you very much you know, for having me on the podcast. Uh, we've really enjoyed uh, doing previous podcasts, myself and my colleagues. So you know, thank you very much. In a way, you know, it's funny that you say that I'm popular. The, the truth is we try to be uh, sort of anything but popular in terms of personalities. And the reason for that is that uh, if you look at the financial landscape, uh, there are quite a lot of people who are, you could call them gurus, where people assume that they have uh, a crystal ball and they have deep insights about how the world uh, should be or what's going to happen. And th the truth is, you know, some people uh, forecast the 1987 crash or they forecast bear markets or they forecast, you know, whatever the event might be. And the, the problem that uh, we see with that approach is that if, if you do that once, there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to do that again. And so it's not necessarily a repeatable process. But what we've tried to do is to figure out what things work regularly. So, you know, what is repeatable? what's robust, meaning it works across different kinds of regimes, and what's scalable, meaning, you know, can, can this insight be applied, not just, let's say, to the U.S., but more broadly, or if you're looking at, you know, emerging markets, for example, and, and looking at, uh, let's say, a currency crisis prediction tool, does this apply actually across time and across many emerging markets? So our uh, background is really basically all X buy side, all X prop traders. We started building tools for ourselves when we were in you know previous lives and different jobs, and and then when we left, we just realized we enjoyed writing uh, to identify trading ideas. And really, over time, our, our client base has grown organically. It's primarily hedge funds, family offices, and some long only managers. And, and really, we've just been sort of sharing our tools and approach with them. And Variant really grew out of trying to find uh, very asymmetric trading ideas. It was uh, in 2005 to 2007, I was uh, on a prop desk with some of my current colleagues. And we were trying to figure out when the next recession might happen. And if you look at what most of Wall Street research it focuses on employment or inflation, and the truth is, if you're running a business, you don't start firing your workers just because you have a bad month or even two or three. So uh, when you see employment, it really lags uh, the business cycle uh, significantly. And likewise, inflation, you don't start hiking your prices you know, just because you have a good month of sales. And so most of the Wall Street research focuses on employment and inflation. And it doesn't really tell you anything about today. It tells you about yesterday. And when you think about stocks and bonds, what you're worrying about is sort of what's going to happen, not what's currently happening or even happened previously. So we have built a lot of leading economic indicators and even more importantly, leading liquidity indicators, because obviously we, the only reason we care about the economy is to find trades. And so we care more about asset prices than we do about industrial production. And if you're trying to forecast changes to asset prices, you really want to be focusing very heavily on global liquidity and uh, credit conditions. And that, that is what we do. And so the good thing is that these tools that we've built – really don't depend on me being a guru or you know, ha having a crystal ball. 
you know, being highly sensitive to my mood or state of mind, these tools work across time and they're repeatable. And so the, the clients that variant perception has really like that. And, you know, that's one reason why we, we try to, you know, we don't put our names on any reports. It's not a guru model. It's really a very much, as you, as you said, a process uh, driven model. And so when we come up with uh, views and, you know, we'll talk about many of our specific views on this podcast, what we're really trying to do is to take these economic and liquidity indicators and find turning points where our tools differ from the consensus. And that's where the name variant perception comes from. Essentially, you know, if, if our tools agree with consensus, then generally it's a momentum trade, meaning, you know, the view is correct and you want to stay with it. But you know, often your most asymmetric trades come when there's a deviation or a difference between what the market's pricing versus what our tools are saying. And so we look at sentiment, positioning, and valuation to try to measure so what is the market thinking and do our tools disagree with that? And so to the extent that our tools are turning up and positive and people are extremely negative and valuations are low um, and, you know, positioning dumb money you know, is not long the asset, that creates great opportunities. So one of our top investment themes last year, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we talked about it, was long Brazil. And that was because valuations on a cyclically adjusted basis were back to 1998 and 2002 levels. And at the same time, retail had been pulling money for three years, and our liquidity and economic indicators were turning up. And the stock market in dollar terms has doubled since then. And so that's sort of how we apply our, our tools. And we'll be talking about a few ideas on this podcast where some of these tools sort of align, you know, where our tools differ significantly from sort of the uh, sentiment, positioning, and valuation. And I feel an obligation just to set expectations with our listeners because we have both an institutional and a retail component to our audience. Uh, unfortunately, there is no $300 newsletter to sign up for if, if uh, they're impressed with you. You are an institutional advisor with institutional pricing. And uh, your variant perception reports, while they are, uh, I've had the privilege of getting a chance to review some of them, uh, they're absolutely fantastic content, but they're institutionally priced and not really within reach of the average retail investor. So it's a real treat to get you on the show. Let's go ahead and dive into you know a topic that I think is just fantastically important right now is the dollar. It is. It seemed like we had a secular bull market in the dollar. I really felt when this pullback occurred that it was set to resume. But I'm becoming more and more persuaded of the dollar bear case. Where do you guys stand in terms of the dollar outlook? Sure. So the, the dollar has been one of the biggest drivers of uh, many different asset classes uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, interestingly, earlier I was talking about uh, sentiment, positioning, and, and valuation. The dollar itself over the last 18 months has, has really gone from one extreme to the other. So if you're looking at, you know, if, if you think, bear in mind, for example, the Trump uh, election, um, last fall. Afterwards, there was the sort of massive reflationary rally. People were expecting tax cuts, infrastructure spending, and the, the dollar rallied significantly. Back then, if you looked at the uh, Economist, for example, they had a front cover that had the, a strong dollar, you know, it was like a muscle man. It was a very contrarian indicator. Uh, if you looked at the Commitment of Traders reports or the Daily Sentiment Index, um, they were extremes in terms of dollar longs. And, and generally, the speculators are wrong at extremes. And, and sure enough, one of our top themes for the year with our clients was a short dollar theme. And that, that really flowed from one valuation. If you look, remember back in December or January and looked at a variety of valuation indicators, and valuation with currencies uh, doesn't really matter in the short run. So you know, the fact that a currency is expensive on a PPP basis or purchasing power parity, you know, the average person... Uh, when you know it's a very sort of lofty sounding name for the idea that tradable goods uh, you know should have similar prices um, and that the big Mac index of the economist is probably the most famous exposition of the purchasing power parity you know and you can then figure out whether the dollar is expensive or not and so if you also you can look at the real effective exchange rate which is sort of how does a currency um, trade relative to a basket of its uh, sort of cross cross rates and then you can look at real interest rate differentials the dollar was very overvalued on almost all of those, and it was really only cheap relative to the uh, Swiss franc and the Norwegian kroner. And you know, if you've ever been to either uh, country, you know that they're absurdly expensive if you're trying to buy a Coke or a beer. Uh, 
And so the dollar was very expensive on a valuation basis. It was obviously very stretched in terms of uh, positioning. And then we had various technical sell signals uh, going off. So the dollar sold off really most of the year in line with what we thought uh, up until um, August or September. And then what's very interesting is we started seeing the opposite. So um, it's not that it had become very cheap. Uh, you know, you, currencies don't move from expensive to cheap that quickly, but it was no longer as expensive uh, as it was. Um, the euro had rallied very significantly against it. And then if you looked at the positioning, uh, everyone had switched essentially from being long dollar to being short dollar. And you know, I, I visit a lot of family offices and hedge funds and very smart people. And you know, in general, these people do pretty well. But when they all agree on one thing, whenever I you know, go to 20 meetings and hear tw- you know, 20 people agreeing on something, you know, chances are – um, that sort of played itself out. And so everyone uh, was very, very negative on the dollar at that time. We then uh, had been recommending long dollars uh, since um, that the trade has worked well. You could argue that it's a counter trend move, meaning that there's greater weakness ahead for the dollar going forward. Um, but one, one thing that's very interesting is if you look at the dollar in terms of interest rate differentials versus a lot of its peers, it, it pays to hold dollars um, in the sense that you're, you're getting almost no uh, carry uh, in, in yen or euros. You are getting it in dollars. You know, the um, interest rates and yields have been rising. The, the euro U.S. exchange rate, which is one of the biggest um, in terms of the dollar, is the, the two-year uh, yield differential is highly correlated. And we've had that chart you know, in, in previous monthlies and, and shown it. Um, and that's pointing to a much, much lower euro and much stronger dollar. So the current supports for the dollar, uh, I would say, are strong in terms of the interest rate differentials. And I think it's very unlikely that the ECB will be hiking despite the – I would argue you need to do that. And so we're still positive on the dollar. And you know, that, that's uh, something that we've been writing about and you know, gotten it fairly well you know, over the last 18 months. And, and that's a, a very good example of applying sort of – the idea of our liquidity indicators and then uh, sentiment and positioning and valuation. So it sounds like this is driven mostly by contrarian views on positioning. Uh, do you think that the secular factors that were contributing to the, the dollar rally are still in place, you know, the, the original dollar rally before it rolled over? Or do you think that now that the ECB is, you know, I think maybe a lot of what drove the dollar higher was the Fed had stopped easing while the ECB was continuing to ease? Is is that still in play or are we potentially looking at a secular reversal of direction here? I, I would hate to call anything um, secular in the sense that I don't think that we have very big secular forces at play with the dollar here. Um, you know, uh, the, most of our views are, are shorter term uh, driven by the, the expected path of, of interest rates and monetary policy um, and, and then uh, sort of sentiment positioning. W- what is true from a structural basis is that the world is generally short dollars. Um, and so in, in a world where uh, you're, you have massive sort of risk on people tend the dollar tends to do uh, poorly in risk off scenarios. Um, as we've seen, you, you generally have a huge sort of dollar, you know, short uh, dollar um, squeeze. You know, where every, everyone basically needs to scramble to get them. And so that's one thing I think that uh, you know is, is not currently the case. Um, if we were to enter a global sort of risk off scenario, that would certainly matter quite a lot. Let's move on, speaking of risk on, risk off, to equity markets generally. I think a theme that we've heard from a lot of our guests is nobody's really saying the stock market is cheap. I haven't heard that. But uh, there's a huge divide. Some people would say, look, these valuations are crazy. Look at the CAPE ratio. It's time. It's, it's all over. Other people are saying, hey, these valuations are ridiculously high, but there's nothing to stop them from going much higher from here. That's what happens is overpriced assets get more overpriced until there's a catalyst to change the direction of the market. And some of our guests have said they don't see the change. Now, when we had Tian Yang, your associate, on, I think it was three or four months ago, uh, he told us that it was not time to be short yet, but he, you guys thought maybe that was coming in coming months. Uh, are we there yet? Is it time to be short? Is it time to be on the sidelines? What do you think about the equity market from here? So if you look at the equity market currently, we're very definitely in what you could refer to as a momentum chasing mode. You know, that often happens uh, relatively late in the economic cycle uh, where valuations are high, um, which means that on a five or 10 year basis, 
your expected returns are very poor. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the next three or six months, in fact. And so the current market, given that you know we still have extremely tight credit spreads, for example, which does a great job in uh, leading the overall economy and even equity markets, those are still very benign. Um, obviously, if we started to see any deterioration in credit, that would be bad for equities. Market health has actually been fairly positive up until now. There have been brief periods of a week or two weeks where we've seen market health deteriorate. Uh, the market's been surprisingly resilient and bounced back. And that's one of the amazing things. Um, if you look at uh, the market this year, there, there are some reliable sell signals. You know, there, there are very few sell signals, in fact, uh, that work. Generally, buy signals are much better. Buy signals, are, you know, bottoms tend to be V-shaped to mark by panic. Tops tend to be much more of a, a rounded process where you end up with uh, distribution. And so, so far this year, no real sell signals have worked. We're still in a momentum chasing mode. And uh, it doesn't mean that on a short-term basis, you know, we, we might not have uh, some sell-offs um, here and there, but uh, so far we, we have yet to see the kind of weakness that we were seeing, for example, in the summer of 2015, uh, when you know we were very negative and you know noted to our clients that you had a lot more 52-week new lows and new highs, you had a deterioration in the advanced decline, and you had a complete uh, sort of meltdown, essentially in parts of the high yield market, specifically energy and, and, and credit spreads did lead equities back then. We're not currently seeing that. So what Tian was, was referring to was these sort of shorter term, sort of three, six month outlook. Um, and, and you have to distinguish that from the valuation perspective. If you remember in 2000, the market peaked in uh, Q1 and, and then the market uh, sort of traded sideways and then went down 50%. And in 2002, the market had basically retraced all its gains from 1996. So when, when declines uh, happen from major market peaks, uh, the drawdowns can be horrific. Um, but like if, if you had been shorting the market purely based on valuation in late 98, 99, um, and even early 2000, um, you, know, you, you would have been on the wrong side of a momentum trade. And that is very similar to sort of where we are now, where – the long-term expected return on a wide variety of uh, metrics is poor, but that doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information over the next, you know, one, two, three, four months. You know, Jonathan, I love the variant perception uh, letters that I've had the privilege of getting a review copy of. You have absolutely fantastic content, and I would love to share it with our listeners. Unfortunately, your institutional paying subscribers would uh, throw a conniption fit if we did that because they're paying through the nose to have exclusive access to uh, your very extensive writings here. Patrick was successful, though, in uh, negotiating very aggressively with your staff. We do have a link in our Research Roundup email to a landing page at Variant Perception. Com. Well, we have a uh, report that you did with an unlikely and so far, I think, very successful call that you made on the retail sector. And that normally is an institutional subscriber content uh, thing that's not available uh, for free. We could not give you the direct download link, folks, in the Research Roundup email because the staff at Variant Perception was concerned that this not just get you know posted on Zero Hedge or something where anybody can see it. So you're going to have to follow the link in the Research Roundup email. It will take you to a landing page at variantperception.com where you're going to have to give them your email address because they do want to track uh, who this one goes to. But it's an excellent report, and you've, your view has been proven, I think, quite prescient so far. So, Jonathan, please tell us, what is this report about? When was it published? What's the call? How's it working out so far? Sure. Um, thank you. So I mentioned earlier the way we sort of think about trades where we have our leading economic indicators, leading liquidity indicators – and then looking at sentiment, positioning, and valuation. Now, if you think about sort of the stars aligning, that doesn't necessarily happen too often. You know, often our tools are merely confirming what most people think. And there's not, you know, there's a momentum trade there, but it's not a great contrarian trade. In this case, this is probably, I have to actually, it's not probably, this is the most uh, contrarian, uh, least liked idea I have ever presented to anyone. And that's saying something given that, I've gone around and talked to clients about our views for many, many years. So uh, this, this uh, idea and this trade uh, is the U.S. retail sector. And I, I recently did a two-week trip in the U.S., uh, east and west coast, and saw about 40 clients and, and potential clients. 
And uh, this, so this uh, report that Macro Voices readers uh, will read is uh, about U.S. retail. And, uh, you know, our, our, our clients and others were looking at this in October, and not a single person liked the idea. I couldn't meet a hedge fund or family office, you know, or long only manager who thought this was a good idea. And if you remember in the summertime, the Economist, once again, uh, you know, the contrary indicator, had a front cover with Amazon taking over the world. And so the the consensus view is that Amazon's growing quickly. It's going to completely decimate existing retailers. And, and therefore, you know, you want to be long Amazon, uh, short the retailers, and, and most, if not all of them, will end up going bust. And the, the problem with this view is, one, that uh, when stocks are priced this way, uh, essentially there's an awful lot of bad news priced in. Retailers basically, in many cases, have to simply not go bust for you to have a good long trade. And when we look at our leading indicators for retail, overall, they're still fairly positive. So they had been negative late last year, early this year. Part of that was due to an increase in rent, an increase in oil prices, and an in- increase in in medical cost, um, you know, some of that was a uh, lagged effect from Obamacare. And so if you think of whatever's, you know, whatever's left over in the consumer budget is left over after they've paid those expenses. And so that had been negative. That had turned back up. Um, the overall U.S. economy-wide retail uh, leading indicator was still positive. And so, you know, we don't see an immediate implosion in the retail sector from a macroeconomic standpoint. Now, from a microeconomic standpoint, you could argue that, you know, the the terrible news of Amazon has already been uh, priced in. And so we we have uh, many specific buy signals that we look at from a country level. We also look at them from a sector level. And believe it or not, some of our uh, buy signals even work on a stock-specific basis with very high back-tested returns. And so some of these signals were then appearing for many retail names. And what's quite interesting with these buy signals is that you'd have to be out of your mind uh, to take them, meaning that, for example, many of our buy signals emerged in Europe in the summer of 2012, and that was when um, everyone thought the euro was going to break up, and, and, and therefore, if you were buying European equities, you'd have to be crazy. Um, likewise, they were emerging in Brazil in the end of 2015, early 2016, and you'd have to be out of your mind to be buying. I mean, The Economist had a front cover with Dilma Rousseff on, on the front page, and there was corruption scandals. And, and, and the truth is, some of the very best buying opportunities happen when everyone thinks something is terrible. You know, you don't tend to get, uh, you know, I think it was Howard Marks who said, you don't tend to get great investments without horrible news. And so the retail idea, you know, we, uh, we I went around with my, my colleague, um, you know, our, our head of business development sales, uh, Denise Hearn, and uh, no one liked the idea. And so sure enough, what's happened, we've had the last month and a half where, uh, retailers posted some positive numbers and then posted not bad numbers. And many of these retailers are up 20, 30, 40%. Now, I think that there's still some left in the trade in terms of a lot of these valuations for some of them were extremely low. And uh, if you look uh, across uh, the, the retail sector, surely some of the sales are going to go to Amazon, but not all these retailers are going to go bust. Many of them don't have a lot of debt. And even when you adjust for leases, they're still fairly cheap. So uh, you'll be able to read that in a report. I think that this is, you know, like Brazil, this is one where all the stars do align or have aligned. And it is a very good view, you know, of how we come up with ideas. It's not a guru-focused model. It's one where we've used our leading indicators. It's one where we've tied that then down to sentiment, positioning, and valuation. And believe it or not, for a lot of these retailers, the short interest was higher than it was after Lehman Brothers, right? I mean, that's telling you something about just how negative the outlook of the average investor towards the sector was. So that's the report that everyone will be getting. And and those are the kinds of reports that we try to produce for clients on a consistent basis. Not every single month has such wonderful ideas, but that's one that's worked out very well for anyone who wanted to take it. Jonathan, I'd like to ask a couple of follow-up questions on this one. Uh, The first is, 
I, I totally get the premise of, okay, uh, everybody and their brother is talking about Amazon is going to, you know, conquer retail. And so to say that that is overplayed, oversold, and there's a dead cat bounce, if nothing else, I, I totally get that. Is that the premise of your trade? Or are you going further than that to say, no, wait, the whole premise that Amazon is essentially defeating conventional brick and mortar retail is not really as bad as people think it is. Is it just that the market is overplayed it, or is it that the fundamental idea is wrong? Well, so I, I don't think that every retailer necessarily will survive. Um, you know, I think for some of them it might be a longer process. You know, perhaps this is a dead cap bounce, but um, I don't think every retailer is going to go bust. I think a lot of them, you know, all have uh, shut lots of stores and you know cut back capex and. There, there's one book that I highly recommend uh, or, or listeners read, and that's Capital Returns. Capital Returns is a phenomenal book. It was it's based on the letters of Marathon Asset Management. It's edited by Edward Chancellor. Uh, it's it's a truly fantastic read, and he, he makes the point that generally the the best times to buy an industry is when you've seen an enormous uh, cutback in capex, when you've seen prices collapse and uh, people exiting the industry. Uh, th that then means that everyone's miserable and depressed. The securities and the, the stocks are generally cheap. And then you end up with a rebound in, in terms of prices, and you end up with uh, an improvement in the overall climate due to a reduction in, uh, in supply. And this is true currently in the retail case, where if you look at Many of the leading brands, we've actually seen an enormous cutback in spending and in, in, in stores. Um, this is also true, actually. We've written a very big report for our clients on oil and gas. And so if you, if you look back at oil, for example, in 2014, that was we, we, we were very negative on oil and gas and, and wrote a very big report to clients pointing out there was too much capex, there was too much debt, and most of these companies were going to go bust. We've since seen 120 bankruptcies in the shale area with $85 billion of debt um, defaulted on. Uh, fast forward three years, it's a very different picture. What you actually see is that global oil capex has gone down by $300 billion, right? And so retail is sort of similar where th these industries go from periods of uh, too many store openings, too much capex, too few you know, stores being opened, too little capex. And uh, if you pay attention to the sort of capital return cycle, it's very useful and instructive in understanding where industries are going. And so I, I, while I do think that there is a dead cat bounce to some of these stocks, I don't think that's true for all these stocks. And uh, a lot of these stocks simply have to not die and adjust themselves to a new reality where they're going to have to do some of their online selling um, as well. You know, and uh, the, the stocks uh, will, will do well. So I, I, it's certainly not an across the board all is clear, but rather for, for many of the stocks, particularly the ones that we identified, you know, they, they've done well, and I think that they will probably continue to do well. My second follow-up question is, you know, this was obviously a good call that you made, but it was a couple months ago, and as you said, you're up 30% on some of the stocks that you recommended. So is this over? Is it done? Is there still room? Uh, does it make sense to consider this trade now, or is it something that's just an example of a, a past trade that worked out for you? So it's it's not that that old of a you know we, we like macro voices so we haven't given you something from February you know we, we've we've given you a report from October so this was our October monthly uh, the trade has worked out much faster than we thought it would um, I think that there is still something left in the trade in the sense that a lot of these stocks are still uh, very cheap relative to where they might trade going forward. And, uh, you know, we don't recommend individual stocks to people. We're, we're top down in orientation. Uh, but what we have done is uh, shown a few stocks where we have specific signals uh, against them and, uh, and then shown the sort of sector overall. Let's move on then to another topic that you have been very outspoken about for the last couple of years, which is Australian real estate. And I think for a while there, you know, you were the guy that wouldn't stop talking about Australian real estate, but nothing was really happening. Well, it looks like maybe it's starting to break, like maybe you're being proven right finally on this Australian uh, real estate situation. Give us the update on what's going on there and particularly what you see coming for the real estate, uh, I think, bubble in Australia. Uh, sure. So I don't like press attention. I try to not appear in the news if I can. 
I, I genuinely don't think there's anything to be had from uh, appearing on CNBC or Bloomberg or anywhere else. I um, would prefer a thousand times over appearing on a thoughtful place like uh, Macro Voices where you can actually do some sort of long form uh, economic analysis versus a two minute soundbite. Uh, but in the case of Australia, what happened was I, I was in uh, Australia visiting my um, very good friend, John Hempton. He writes a blog, which I highly recommend everyone read. It's called uh, Bronte Capital. He lives near um, Bronte Beach. And uh, John Hempton is a genius. And, uh, you know, I, I always learn an enormous amount when I'm with him. So I, I went out to Australia just to hang out with him and uh, spend time on the beach and it's thought not, nothing more of it. It was really when I was there that uh, – uh, he introduced me to a friend of his who is a reporter for 60 Minutes. And um, so he uh, asked if I would talk about the housing market. And John and I at that stage had, uh, for fun, gone to see a house auction. And this sounds weird to anyone who's not Australian. But believe it or not, they auction uh, houses as if they were auctioning Picassos. So, uh, you know, if you live in a middle class neighborhood and there was a house for sale at the end of your street – you'd get a hundred people showing up and there would be trucks that would cater to uh, adults give, serving them coffee and ice cream for the kids. And everyone would watch a middle-class house be sold in an open auction. And so John and I went and saw that and saw a couple of those auctions and thought it was totally nuts. The prices people were paying for, you know, it was effectively a, a middle-class area very far from the beach in Sydney. So we thought, you know what, this is too much fun. Uh, we're, we're both uh, nerds and love investing in economics and so on. So we, we then uh, decided to drive around uh, greater Sydney and, and further afield uh, outside of Sydney and uh, visit uh, a lot of the construction sites. So we, we went to, you know, sort of new tracts of land uh, out west. We went to high-rise apartments that were being built. And then we started speaking to mortgage brokers, to buyers, and so on. And it became very clear that in the United States, there was uh, an awful lot of very bad lending that was driven by uh, mortgage fraud, you know, so the liar loans. Um, that is present in Australia. Now, the mortgage lenders in Australia insist that's not the case. Uh, the central banks uh, very much like in Ireland and Spain, it are essentially shills for the bank, uh, for the banking sector. It's not to say that everyone who works at the RBA uh, in the Reserve Bank of Australia is a shill, but overall, um, you end up with what's known as regulatory capture. And so, uh, John, what John and I saw is is denied by uh, the mortgage industry and by the, uh, the Reserve Bank, but actually there's quite a lot of lying on loans. So it's very clear that a lot of the bubble dynamics in terms of People taking on an enormous amount of debt, where Sydney is now 12 to 13 times um, household income in terms of price. In America, at the peak, New York and San Francisco were about seven times, to put that in perspective. And then nationally, it was about five times in, you know, uh, in, in the U.S. and in Australia, it's, it's much closer between six and seven. Um, you do have, obviously, some cities uh, that are lower and then Sydney and Melbourne that are quite high. So we, we were fairly negative and put out a report on this uh, to our clients and, and pointed out that uh, building permits are the best, longest leading indicator of economic activity. And they're also one of the best leading indicators for house prices. So if you're a builder and you have trouble selling, generally what happens is you build less and you know, you're just, you know it's harder to move houses. Um, and so uh, what we've seen is a sharp downturn in building permits in Australia um, and if you're looking at uh, house sales, while the price level overall appears positive, you've actually seen fairly steep drops in some cities, um, sort of like Perth and Brisbane. And then you're actually seeing a very steep drop in some suburbs in Sydney, you know, which are less attractive or overbuilt. And then what's very interesting is, um, you know, stocks. If you and I wanted to sell Apple tomorrow, you could do that in 30 seconds, you know, or even less, in fact, depending on, you know, how good we were with our – uh, trading program, you know, whether it's Schwab or E-Trade, you can't do that with a house. And generally, the problem with houses is that people have an idea in their own mind of what their house is truly worth. And so, you know, if you think your house is worth 1.5 million, uh, then you're going to be unlikely to sell it at 1.2 or 1.3. And so you're just going to sit on it. And so eventually, though, you're going to come around to the realization that it's not worth 1.5. You're going to sell it for, you know, one or 800 or whatever the ultimate price is. Australia right now has a very interesting uh, feature that 
how sales overall in Australia are at four-year lows. And this is not what you'd really expect in a very healthy housing market with a lot of new construction and fairly high prices. And so what we are seeing a downturn in Perth, Brisbane, um, su- suburbs in, in Sydney and in Melbourne, and uh, four-year lows in, in volume of sales. And I think all of this is, is telling you that there's a problem. And then when you look at um, in terms of debt, debt's continued to grow. Um, some of the bank, the main banks have tightened lending conditions. Some of the non-bank lenders have picked up lending. But overall, you've seen wages in Australia, particularly real wages, which is wages after inflation, have been negative for a few years now and are negative now. And at the same time, we've seen credit growing at 5 to 6%. So very clearly, people are not able to service the mortgage with higher rates and are, th- their debt levels are rising relative to disposable income and to household income. And so Australia scores very poorly, um, not only on ours, but also on IMF and the uh, Bank of International Settlements and almost any risk metric. So people can say whatever they like about me or my friend John Hempton and our work that we did investigating the housing bubble there. But if you actually take a outside view, and uh, and by outside, I mean if you read the great work of Daniel Kahneman, he pointed out that generally people who are insiders think that they have unique insights, that you know this time is different, that whatever the details of this particular story is are true. But if you have an outside perspective, meaning that you look at most countries before they've blown up, you've seen a few things in common. You've seen the bank assets to GDP have been very high. Mortgage lending relative to household income have been very high. You've generally seen rapid appreciation in house prices. You've seen a lot of lying uh, or exaggeration of income and costs in terms of mortgage lending. All of these are present in Australia. And so that is the picture that we see in Australia today. And it would be extremely unlikely statistically that Australia would not have a problem given that it, it checks so many boxes. Now, when the U.S. housing bubble was falling apart, uh, the investment opportunity was so clear and so uh, ripe that there was a movie about it, The Big Short. But that's because the U.S. housing lending market was securitized and you could buy credit default swaps on subprime uh, CDOs. You don't have a securitized uh, lending market in Australia, as I understand it. So what is it that's at risk here? Is it the banking shares themselves? Is it something else? What's going to give when uh, when this falls apart? Sure. So, I, I mean, I, I think that one of the big problems when we discuss ha- housing in general, you know, from now going forward is that Michael Lewis's book was a great success. Uh, everyone's now seen the movie. And so everyone thinks like, you know, whatever short there is, is the big short. In fact, when John and I went around Sydney and then our report was leaked to the public, um, we still don't know who did it. They were saying, oh, this is the next big short. Well, we've never said that. It, it, the situation that presented itself in the United States was truly unique in the sense that you had these asymmetric uh, derivatives that you could trade on. Um, some people did. And that, this is not true in every housing downturn. There were no asymmetric derivatives um, in the Spanish downturn. There were none in the um, Irish downturn. And there are none in the Australian downturn. And so the the fact that you don't have an asymmetric trade via CDSs doesn't mean that the situation is not completely screwed up and that, you know, this is not a a disaster waiting to happen. So in the case of Australia, um, I know that you wanted to talk about China. We had spoken before this podcast went on. You know, they're, they're basically highly levered to the Chinese demand for iron ore and Australian commodities, and they're highly levered to Australian housing. And, you know, neither of those do I think can turn out well. So you think uh, Kyle Bass will eventually be proven right on his theory that the credit expansion in China is going to blow up and it's going to force the PBOC to markedly devalue the yuan, potentially creating a deflationary shock risk to the rest of the world? Are you in line with that view? And is Australian housing potentially a proxy indicator that something's coming there? Uh, so I, I've not actually specifically seen what Kyle Bass has, has talked about um, in terms of a, a video or podcast. So I, I would hate to uh, comment or characterize his views. But but broadly speaking, if, if we look at China, China scores very poorly on almost all debt metrics. So we've, we've seen like an enormous buildup in, in uh, private debt, not government debt, but private debt. And in many countries, it tends to be in the household sector. In China, it's primarily in the corporate sector. 
And if you look at previous crises, normally when they reach the level of debt that China's reached, it leads to problems. So uh, either China is different, and this time it is different, or China has problems that normally have led to um, you know crises. And so in the case of China, what's happened is that uh, the Communist Party runs the country, and they want growth. So you know, you, you, you can get growth by having uh, sort of healthy or reasonable growth, or you and I could build a uh, factory of, um, you know, building something totally useless. And you could get growth, meaning that we would build a factory, we hire workers, we build useless products. But it doesn't mean that's good for the long term. It doesn't mean that we're going to get a return on our investment as shareholders. So in the case of China, what's happened is you have a lot of state-owned enterprises taking on an enormous amount of debt. You also have an enormous amount of building in terms of house prices or housing units. And then that also creates a a bubble in terms of house prices. And it doesn't mean that, you know, there's uh, all these houses are needed. It doesn't mean that this is a good use of of debt. But what you've seen is, for for example, in late 2015, early 2016, you had 15 percent of Chinese GDP uh, was sort of debt was increased, sorry, by 15 percent of Chinese GDP in terms of the equivalent. All right, so this is a massive increase in leverage. Now, China did manage to grow. It did manage to reflate a lot of commodity prices, but you could argue that this is not a very good thing in the long run. What you need is shutting down bad businesses, building fewer homes, you know, basically trying to make sure that growth is productive rather than having growth for growth's sake. And so the supreme irony is that you know, whenever I speak to people um, you know, who, who follow China, not closely, they always talk to me about China undergoing a sort of uh, capacity reduction and deleveraging. And in, in, in China, they talk about sort of deleveraging with Chinese characteristics. And that's where you talk about deleveraging, but actually keep on releveraging. And that's currently what's going on. While we're on this subject, let's cover Canada as well, because a lot of people have said that Australian real estate is a precursor for what's about to be the next shoot a drop, which they think is Canada. What's your feeling there? Is the Canadian real estate situation also in a bubble that is uh, precariously perched as Australia has been? Uh, The answer is uh, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, Canada has enormous amount of uh, problems in terms of the uh, debt to uh, household uh, income, debt to GDP. And if you look at lending, it's not, I I would argue, necessarily as bad as Australia, but it's certainly not good. And like Australia, I've been a big beneficiary of Chinese money inflows. Those are slowing down in both places. And so uh, Canada does score very poorly on, on most what you again, as I was talking about Kahneman and an outside perspective, Canada scores very poorly on, on most of the uh, traditional debt metrics. Okay, we are going to uh, need to leave it there in the interest of time. But before we close, for the benefit of our institutional listeners, first of all, who are able to consider the excellent services you offer, give us a quick rundown of what Variant Perception does. But then if you could also, just for for the benefit of our retail audience, uh, is there anything at all that they can follow in terms of blog posts or uh, you know anything that's uh, within reach of the retail investor that you guys do, Twitter handles, anything like that? Uh, sure. So we, we don't currently have a retail product. Uh, we might in the uh, future uh, offer a much more limited uh, set of uh, tools and views. But uh, currently our clients are hedge funds, family offices, um, endowments, and uh, some long-only managers. And uh, our views, we do occasionally post uh, on our blog. Uh, so uh, if you visit variantperception.com, you can find our blog. You can follow that, obviously, with a, you know an RSS reader or Feedly if you want. And then uh, we do tweet uh, charts that we think are interesting. So you can follow us on Twitter. I think there was a, a shortage of letters. So we're, I think we're VRNT Perception. But just search for us, Variant Perception on Twitter. Uh, we do tweet uh, regularly. And then you know we, we don't really uh, give our views uh, frequently or even uh, publicly in the sense that you know our clients pay us for our views. So w- why would we undercut our clients' trust? Um, but you know we love macro voices, and uh, also you know many family offices and hedge funds do listen to macro voices, and so that's one reason why uh, we enjoy being on the show. And so obviously, if you do work in an institutional client, uh, you know or institutional. So if you subscribe to the kind of research that we offer, we'd love to speak to you. And uh, so uh, if you visit variantperception.com, we also have a contact form. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a genuine pleasure uh, being able to do a podcast like this 
we don't like Bloomberg or, or CNBC, and uh, it's it's just always enjoyable to be able to be in a forum like this. Well, it's a real pleasure for us to have you on the show, and someday we're going to uh, twist enough arms to get one of your excellent variant perception letters, even if it's an old one, uh, out to our listeners, because I think you've got some really fantastic content there. I can't thank you enough for another great interview, Jonathan. We look forward to having you back on the show soon. Patrick Serezna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Eric what a great interview with Jonathan. It was great to have him back on the show. Now, I want to take the, uh, jump right in this post game to uh, our special guest because we have uh, Devin Anderson joining us. Now, Devin is the managing director, equity derivatives at a large bulge bracket firm. Now, we brought him on the show because we wanted to further discuss the VIX complex. How are you doing today, Devin? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. Devin, it's great to have you on. What I'd like to do is start by kind of moving back to the big picture because we talk so much about the short vol trade in quotes. And I think a lot of people don't realize, wait a minute, the VIX, the index, that's one thing. VIX futures contracts, that, that's another thing. There are other ways that people are playing the short vol trade through other derivatives. So give us the big picture. How did this whole trend of trading the short side of vol come into play in the first place? What are all the different places that it's happening? And, you know, kind of give us the big picture of the landscape and the mechanisms of the various instruments that are involved in this trade. Yeah, sure. So there's really two broad groups, and there's more, but the two ones that really matter in terms of short vol trades are there's a VIX-based set of trades that people do, and then there's a bunch of s and center trades using S&P fixed strike or what we would call plain vanilla options, puts and calls. So in the first group, we'll call those like the group one VIX trades. That's the stuff you guys have been talking about on the podcast I listened to last week, where for the most part, retail is accumulating positions in XIV, and we'll kind of get to how that works in a minute, or they're outright short VIX futures. And the mechanics of these ETNs actually matters quite a bit. So You hear people referencing the VIX spot index. So uh, today's November 30th. The VIX closed at at about 11 spot three. But I think a lot of people will be fascinated to know there are actually zero financial derivatives tied directly to that VIX spot index. Uh, It's calculated as a weighted average of the next 30 calendar days starting today. So from today to December 30th, there actually aren't any derivatives tied to that. Where there are derivatives tied to are the VIX futures. So there's right now there's a DEC future, a JAN future, a Fed future, and so on. And each one of those futures is a measurement of expected volatility from the day it expires to 30 days forward from that. So that means that the, the front month future, the first future is the December future, which is an expectation of vol between of implied volatility between December and January. That's how the futures market works. So each future is essentially a forward. These ETFs that people talk about, XIV, which is the short ETF, VXX, which is the long ETF, TVIX, which is the double long ETF, these, actually, they're not even all ETFs, some are ETFs and some are ETNs, which is going to kind of play in, into later in the conversation. But the way these things work is they own a calendar-weighted position in the first two months future. So, for example, again, today is November 30th, the VXX, the long vol ETF, has a 54% weight in December and a 46% weight in January. So that's important because the actual level of the VIX that matters to the ETFs as of the close today is about 12 and a quarter, all right? Not the uh, 1130 number that I mentioned before, which is the spot VIX. So the inverse fall ETF does the opposite of VXX, it's short vol. Today it's short at 12 and a quarter, right? And when people talk about these things possibly having to redeem this 80% knockout level, it's 80% of that number, not 80% of the spot index, right? So already this is a couple points difference. So 
if we were to calculate that 80% knockout level from the VIX spot, you get something like uh, 8.5 or 840. The actual level of the amount that vol would have to go up in the VIX futures, at least today, would be just under 10 vols, right? Now, let's talk about like what, 10, what a 10 vol instantaneous shift in the, in the weighted average VIX future looks like. We typically say, uh, as a heuristic, as a rule of thumb, that the, uh, the VIX futures have on the downside a beta to the S&P of about one, right? It gets a little bigger. It has some convexity as the movement in the S&P goes up. So let's say the, the market were to sell off 4%. We'd expect that front month future to be up something like four points, okay? For the front month future to be up 10 points, right, which is the kind of levels that we're talking about, necessary for the XIV to, you know, to redeem, uh, or at least that the issuer could, to, could begin a redemption process, you know, you're talking about a one-day move on the order of something like 8 to 11% in S&P spot in one day, right? So for me, when I hear people talk about the danger of the VIX complex, I'm not saying that it isn't a danger. It absolutely is a danger. And you know what is scary about it is that we've never, since these products have gotten this big, we've never really seen what happens to them on a stress event. But I will also say that the scenarios where this stuff really gets scary start at something like the S&P selling off between 4.5% and 5.5% in a single day, and they start to get potentially very scary at a 7% plus kind of move. But, again, understand these things rebalance every day. So every day is essentially new. You actually need all of that to happen in a single day to get the really apocalyptic scenarios. And, you know, when you hear people getting really apoplectic about this, it's got to happen very, very fast. So that's kind of the VIX side of the house. There's also a whole short fall trade that goes on that's mostly done for high net worth individuals at private banks or by what we would call an overlay manager that trades the strategy and books it directly to the client's account. So these are folks that sell puts. They sell other structures. Sometimes they'll sell a put and they'll sell a call, then they'll buy the wings back. We call those a condor. There's a whole bunch of this stuff out there as well, and that's all based directly on the underlying S&P. Now, those strategies don't have this big one-day sensitivity that the VIX complex does. Instead, what they have is a lot of sensitivity to a cumulative return inside of what I would say is about a six-week period because that's about the ten, average tenor of those trades. So if the S&P were to sell off 10%, not in one day, but over the course of, let's say, three weeks, that stuff potentially starts to squeeze and you get a bid to that. And the truth of the matter is that that stuff is actually a little bigger than the S&P. However, when you talk to people that manage that stuff on, be- on those types of mandates on behalf of customers, what you find out is that the sizing is actually pretty responsible. So let's say you know, they're selling puts. They're, maybe they're only selling puts on 5 to 10% of the, cl- of the available collateral in the client's account. Well, you know, it actually, if you're selling 5% out of the money six-week puts – and you're doing it not on all of the money and you know all of the available collateral on the account, but simply five to ten percent of it. It actually takes quite a bit to shake those guys out of that position. So that stuff, while sensitive to a more cumulative return over you know let's say like I say about a three to six week window, is actually pretty durable. So when you add all this up, you really need a lot before things begin to become very very scary. So. You know, I share your other guests' concern about this complex kind of in the tails, but it really needs to be a tail event before these feedback loops begin to generate and feed on themselves. Uh, one more kind of stat about the VIX, just to try and put some numbers to it. Um, you know, our math suggests that something like if you had a five, a five vol spike in the VIX, and, uh, and again, in that front month future, which is, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like even more than that in the VIX spot index, Something like 173 million Vega of VIX futures would have to be traded to rebalance that, okay? Average daily volume of the VIX futures is something like 250 to 500 million Vega, depending on the day. And in fact, you know, you get some days, like just I was looking before our phone call, on November 9th, nearly 600 million Vega of VIX futures traded on November 9th. And that was a day that had an intraday spot trading range of less than a percent, about 80 basis points, right? Right. 
So there's actually a fair amount of liquidity on an average day to meet this type of trading. Now look, something really bad happens, we get a shock event, it's difficult to know, right? The, the complex has never really been tested in an extreme scenario. But I guess my big overriding point is you really need an extreme scenario for this stuff to go bad. I want to push back on a, a few different aspects of that. First of all, I want to agree with you that the people, you know, high net worth accounts that are selling condors to produce income, they have enough money. If something goes wrong, they can cover it. But I want to go to what happens, you know, when all these people are selling vol, who they're selling the vol to. Ah, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's a good question. So our view on, you know, it's, it's tough to know precisely but we certainly, as as a as an option dealer, see the flow, right? Uh, and we have a pretty good sense of it. And my sense of it is that it's actually fairly well diffuse among people that use the VIX complex as a hedge. So while the short side of the VIX complex gets a lot of attention, the truth of the matter is we're facilitating institutional clients that are using it as a hedge. They're using either VIX options as a hedge, where you know the dealers turn around and, turn around and essentially buying those VIX futures as the delta hedge to their options for the options that they facilitated on behalf of the institutional client. Or there's people actually just owning VIX futures outright in an account as a hedge, or maybe they're short puts or, you know, kind of anything that, uh, short puts or long calls, anything that essentially creates that long, that long VIX future. So I think that biggest chunk of the other side of the shortfall is actually in institutional hands as hedgers. And hopefully those guys are doing the right things with their cash portfolios and their asset allocations that, you know, paying the decay of that, which has not been trivial. That's the whole point. That's why people are doing the short vol trade. Hopefully that their alpha generation is such that, you know, that that's a sustainable business for them. Devin, I want to push back on a couple aspects of that, because the first thing which I agree with, if you say, you know, you ask people what's happening to this vol and people say, well, it's, it's basically it's being sold and that's what creates cheap options for people to be able to uh, to hedge. On the side of this, that's people writing condors and straddles. Yeah, I get it. But as a futures trader, you know, the people that are shorting VIX futures, whether it be through the XIV or directly, they're getting paid primarily on the carry. They make their money, as you said, not because the VIX is going to go down from 11 to 5, but because every subsequent futures contract is a little bit higher than the one before it. And every time they roll it, they slowly recapture that contango in the form of a carry. So... Somebody's paying the other side of that, and for every open futures long, there has to be uh, an open future short. So for these gazillion contracts that are short, either by direct holding in accounts or in the XIV, somebody has that size of a long in VIX futures. So the thing that, that I'm struggling with here, I understood what you said about how the S&P would have to move 10 points in a day, but the reason I disagree with you is... Even if the VIX index, which as you described, is not linked directly to the derivatives, even if the VIX index only moves, let's say the S&P sells off 5% in, a, in an hour, everybody's freaking out about something, you know, news event, the VIX index is only going to move that five vols down. But if that causes a bunch of people to panic out of the XIV, it's time for them to, to cover their short. They have to buy. And, and the, the market makers, as you know, if everybody is liquidating their XIV shares, it means that market makers have to uh, essentially buy futures in order to make up for that activity. If they're buying futures in that environment where you've got a market event going, if I'm the guy who's long VIX futures, I ain't selling, dude. Uh, I'll let it go to double what the VIX index is before I'm going to sell my futures contract. So I see a squeeze in the futures contract, in the open interest of the futures, even if the underlying VIX index doesn't move as much as we, you know, we think it might have to. Am I wrong to think that? The part that I think... So Again, kind of in an extreme tail event, I don't disagree with the logic. I think the one part that you're missing, though, is that there is a no arbitrage relationship between the VIX and the S&P vol market. Okay, and let me explain what I mean by that. So if you take a VIX future and you add a certain combination of VIX options to it, 
you get exactly this thing called a variant swap, which is um, an institutional contract that trades over the, over the counter. The details of it are interesting but unimportant. The important part is that that instrument creates an equivalence mathematically between VIX futures and options and S&P options, okay? Now, it's not perfect, and basis can develop between the two, but there actually is more liquidity there than you would potentially um, otherwise might think because there are both hedge funds uh, and banks and players in the market that will trade the relative value between the VIX, the VIX version of that variant swap and the S&P version of that variant swap. So that's, I hear you, like, it, let's say that the long side of, of the VIX futures is all in hedgers' hands and, you know, none of them decide that they want to sell or close. There actually is an arbitrage vehicle by which people can come in and start taking the other side of what would be at that time an ever-increasing basis between the fair value of the VIX world and the fair value of the S&P surface world. Now, again, like we've never seen it happen. But I will tell you that I mean, we have people that watch and are ready to react to this stuff. I know because we see the orders. So there are mechanisms by which additional liquidity comes in to put a cap on it. Now, but look, in a, in a big enough event, like, kind of all bets are off. But I'm concerned about it in, like, the 7% kind of daily move scenario. I'm not so concerned about it in a lot of, in a lot of smaller moves. Let's just, for the sake of, of hypotheticals here, and it's a big hypothetical, I admit that, but, you know, 87 was a 22% a move in one day. So let's suppose we're talking about a bigger than 15% move in one day on the S&P. Admittedly, that's a 20-year event, but, you know, we're kind of due for one here. If that happened, it seems to me like XIV could get to a situation where it's at zero equity. It has to buy futures. People are not selling futures because, as you say, in a really big event, all bets are off. And potentially, you get to the point where XIV, when it finally covers, is massively negative equity. Now, as far as I understand it, I don't know about ETNs, but in an ETF, it's, it's an equity. There's no way for the ETF to claw back losses that it's, uh, the, it's, it's due for from its shareholders. They can't lose more than 100%. But the futures account can lose more than 100%. That's right. So there's no way for the ETN either. But that's why there are these... You know, when, if you read the prospectus for XIV, which which is an ETN, you know, it, when you buy XIV, you're buying a uh, you're buying a note. You're, you know, you're buying a credit obligation of someone, well, specifically Credit Suisse, to give you the payout of the note at the end, right? So they have the option to essentially redeem the fund after an 80% change in the VIX, right, in the value of the front month future. And there's also force majeure clauses that, like, you know, you talk to professionals in the space, and it's actually not perfectly clear what the sequence of events would occur. Like, uh, you know, some people say that they could actually begin to redeem the fund earlier than that under certain circumstances. You know, like, I, I'm not a securities lawyer, and I, I don't want to get into you know, kind of my view of the right way to interpret the language and the perspectives. But the point is that they're actually going to have quite a bit of leeway to begin redeeming it before it gets to um, zero equity. Now, that's all and well, as long as it's not an instantaneous down 15% move, right? Like, if we want to imagine instantaneous down 15% moves, then yes, the scenario you're painting could definitely happen where the where essentially the the hedge to the ETN has a bunch of negative equity and all of the equity of the ETN is gone. It's possible. And who eats the, the loss then? Is it the exchange that eats the loss? And what systemic risk does that create for other investors? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a great question. I mean, you know, the, the issuer of the ETN is the one who has the hedge. Now, I will tell you that they don't necessarily have all the risk of the ETN. Sometimes they spread that risk around to other dealers. So, but ultimately, it is the issuer of the ETN. Now, I, I find it hard to believe that that anyone at the issuer of the ETN is going to is allows a risk position that you know would let that would let the redemption of the XIV below their whole firm up. You know, that's, I, I got to believe the risk management is better than that. 
so, you know, I, I would like to believe that's under control, but, you know, I'm really just kind of guessing at this point. I mean, I, I don't think there's any vol professional in the market that that really thinks they know what's going to happen if something that extreme were to occur. But what you're describing is possible, but I think unlikely. Before we move off this XIV, I don't know whether this is transparent or not in terms of the disclosures that are made, but do they hedge these things? I mean, if I was designing XIV, I would make sure that it owns a whole bunch of -of out-of-the-money calls on VIX futures so that that risk gets laid off to somebody else in the event of an extreme event. Do they do that kind of thing? Well, I mean, they certainly are hedging it. They're not just taking the other side. And they're hedging it with VIX futures, right? And then they actually transfer some of the replication risk to other dealers in an over-the-counter market. So it's not even clear to me that the entirety of the XIV replication burden rests entirely with the issuer, right? They could be laying that some, some of that off to other dealers essentially for a fee. So now ultimately the issuer is responsible for it, right? But you know, you should also point out that's all relevant to ETNs. I mean, the ETF, which is I think maybe the structure you were thinking of at first. You know, the ETF is a trust. When the trust is out of capital, the trust is out of capital. That's a little bit more of a dire situation. There are other vol ETNs structured in that way, but they are not as big as XIV. Okay, so if we wrap this whole risk thing up, it sounds to me, tell me if I've got this summary right, basically the fears that a lot of people have you think are overdone if we're talking about a relatively uh, realistic event, say less than a 5% in one day. But at the same time, you acknowledge if we go beyond 7% in one day, and especially if it happened very quickly, let's say that uh, you had a North Korea fires an actual nuclear missile at the United States, and there, there's a eight or nine or ten percent move on the S and P in 20 minutes. That's where basically nobody really knows what's going to happen with these volatility products at that point. Am I, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I I think that that we don't know. I think that we will be surprised at how much liquidity actually does come out of the woodwork just based on watching the volume dynamics every day. But, um, but you know, we don't know. The complex uh, has never been tested. Finally, Devin, as a closing question, how do we get to this point where this trade has just become so incredibly popular and so much leverage across the system? And how do we get out of it? Yeah, and, and I guess I should qualify that to say, is this a problem we need to get out of? And if so, how do we get out of it? So w- when I talk to institutional investors, about you know why they short vol and where the short vol lives, you know it's it's mostly in yield mandates, right? So you know if we back up and talk about why do people bother with this at all, right? It's because they're reaching for yield. Well, why are they reaching for yield? They're reaching for yield because interest rates are very low, right? And interest rates are very low because of central bank policy, right? You know I, I guess I want to qualify a little bit. You know you hear people talking about printing money and it's not really printing money so much. It's the primary transmission mechanism of, of QE is altering investors' liquidity preference. So the guy, you know, you, you buy a bunch of assets, right, and you drive interest rates down, and the guy that was invested in treasuries has now got to buy IG, and the guy that owned IG has got to buy high yield, and the guy that owned high yield has got to buy equities, and the guy that owned equities has got to buy riskier equities, or you know, or EM, or he's going to start selling options and finding other things to replace this yield. So you know, the real transmission mechanism of QE is this process of yield and return substitution. So in that world, vol gets very low, uh, or I should say, you combine that with a recovering economy. So if I showed you a chart of growth and inflation volatility, what you'd find is that low realized vol in equity markets is extremely coincident to low volatility in growth and inflation expectations, low vol- realized volatility of GDP, and low realized volatility of CPI. So you combine that with the search for yield and volatility sellers, and you end up with an environment where you have very low realized vol, which creates very low short dated volatility, and then a steep term structure because people assign risk you know, more relative risk on a term structure basis than they would in a higher volatility environment. And that's what powers all this stuff. That's what powers people wanting to sell VIX futures for the roll down or buy XIV for the roll down. It's what makes people want to sell out of the money puts because they're all looking for yield in this steep term structure, low realized fall environment, you know, is a tasty target for that. 
So a lot of people, you know, people ask me, like, how, how is this all going to end, right? And I feel like a lot of the coverage of this ends in people wanting to say, the only way out is a shock. Oh, you know what? Also, I should add this is an amazing statistic. 17% of all outstanding debt in the world, so we're talking about, we're talking about sovereign and credit, 17% of that, 17% of $48 trillion is $8 trillion, trades at a negative interest rate. So think of the demand for U.S. Treasuries do not have a negative interest rate. If, if when Europe turns around and goes the other way in central bank policy and the Fed raises rates three times and the term structure starts to steepen because maybe now there's some inflation created by wages, all of this system can reverse. It's just a question of speed. All of those things aren't things that act quickly. These, these fundamental drivers of all the volatility regime that I'm describing. So I think there's actually a fairly natural path out of all of this that isn't a shock. It's the process of normalizing interest rates, all of this yield-seeking substitution channel reversing, and we begin to go back to a more normal interest rate environment, which doesn't require people to come in and sell options for yield. And I think, by the way, that happens. It's something around the 4% level in the 10 year. I mean, it's just kind of like from talking to people and asking a bunch of institutional folks this question. So, you know, a shock can reverse this in, this volatility regime and the, and the desire to solve all. But I also think that the slow reversal of central bank policy and, and slowly rising interest rates, as well as a, steep, a steeper interest rate term structure, can take care of this too. Devin, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and filling us in in more detail on the mechanics of this VIX trade. We're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. Folks, you've heard it before. You're hearing it again. We really need your help with promoting the program in order to get more listeners. That's what allows Patrick to get the very best guests on the program. So please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Only takes a few minutes. It's completely free. We won't spam you. We won't try to sell you anything. What you'll get, your benefit, is the free research roundup email, which is just a compendium of links to the very best content that we can find on the internet each week, including downloads from our feature interview guests. And it never contains any advertising or marketing. Patrick, tell them what they can expect in this week's Research Roundup. All right. Well, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview with Jonathan. There's also the link that you can get for the Variant Perception Retail Report that Jonathan referenced during the interview. You'll also find a link to Jeffrey Snyder's recent article, Japanification Denial. There's also a link to David Rosenberg's recent article, Seeking Value in an Expensive World. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us, e- send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already.
You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.